Nathan, it's lovely to have you today for the interview. In regarding uh, Revenge of the Guaylo, what's your fascination with martial arts? I think with the martial arts, you know, I've, I've done so many different styles in my life. So this was kind of an opportunity to uh, try various styles within the one film because the character actually knows hmm, maybe four or five styles. So what I wanted to do is rather than just have um, a movie where let's say it's all about Muay Thai boxing and you've got two Muay Thai boxers, you know, going at it and it's, it's not predictable but that's all you kind of get. I wanted to have a character who knew different styles so when he came into the situation where there were different types of opponents and different nationalities from different styles, he could quickly adapt um, so that he could do karate if needed or he could do kung fu or he could do taekwondo depending on the environment uh, to combat all those skills. So that was, that was why I did it. Great, so you seem to play a lot of anti-heroes. Do you like playing the dark characters and characters with dark stories? Just explain a bit about that. That's an interesting question. A lot of my scripts, I guess, kind of lean towards the anti-hero in a sense that I don't want to be like all the other films, okay? I don't want to be too predictable. So they're either, I've either written anti-heroes for other people or quite often the characters I'm playing uh, have a dark edge or a dark past or um, possibly um, a horrific outcome <laughs> rather than you know, your nice happy ending. And I think that's all just part of kind of indie filmmaking and uh, uh, these particular genres I work in and uh, let's say cult films. Um, kind of, I guess, attract a darker ending and things like that. But, I, you know, I come from the roots of horror, so maybe that's also why. Do you change your image and look a lot when you play your characters or do you like to keep it simultaneous? Great question. I do enjoy going into character, so if I have to change my image, if I have to change the colour of my hair or whatnot, so be it. I actually find that helps you as an actor. There's often this little thing that kind of um, triggers the character for you. So uh, let's say um, it's a particular uh, piece of wardrobe that I'm wearing, or maybe it's an earring, or maybe it's uh, the beard I've grown or whatnot. It kind of, I kind of enjoy the process, which I think a lot of actors do. You're always looking for that, um, that kind of thing to trigger the character because it's different to you. You know, you're playing someone else. With the love scene in the movie with Esme, the character, uh, were you friends beforehand or was it a bit awkward? Tell us a bit about that. <laughs> we became friends after the first audition and I think she had in mind she might try uh, one of the other roles but as I, as I got talking to her and going through the casting process I kind of found that or I, I discovered in a part of her that was like the character so I approached her to perhaps entertain the idea of playing the Esme character and she was kind of like hmm yeah, yeah, I could, I could do that. So that was awesome. So I guess from that point, um, you know, when you're doing a love scene, obviously you've got to be professional. Uh, you've, you've got to really um, approach it uh, objectively. And she was at a point in her career as well where she'd been learning um, with, with her acting training at her school how to, how to tackle that particular type of scene. So it was perfect timing for her. Um, and of course, I've done them before, so I know exactly what to do. Um, so I guess it was... It was uh, Timing, good timing, you know. Yeah, and we became friends and then that made it easier. The thing she said in the end was that acting with me was like acting with her best mate. You know, it was, more, it was a friendship that was built. Yeah. So it made it easier to do the scene. Um, if we didn't have any, any chemistry or we weren't friends, we didn't like each other, it just wouldn't work. You know, it'd be a terrible scene or you'd have to recast. Yeah. You shot the movie in Melbourne, great city. Um, which I've noticed that's the thing that you do a lot with your movies, you shoot it locally. Um, any reason why here, not any other parts of the world? I think because I'm from Melbourne, it's easier to get a film made. Uh, I can access the cast and crew, you know, quite easily. So, uh, and a lot of my stories, you know, because I, I write a lot of my own films as well, so I guess I'm, I'm writing them with a sense that I'm either playing them or I'm going to make them. So uh, I guess it's, it's kind of, I guess, where, where your roots are from and where, you know, where you're placed at that particular time. You're, you're probably naturally going to write about um, your surroundings. Yeah. So not to say that I don't want to do international films and that I haven't been on sets overseas. 
uh, but I think I've, I've stayed true to my roots. You know, a lot of guys, you know, they've gone overseas and they've chased the, they've chased the dream, let's say in Hollywood or, or uh, the UK. Um, but I, I guess what I'm trying to do is uh, be true to my voice, which is that I am Australian, I am in Melbourne, I am a filmmaker. I'm trying to make it in my hometown. I've always had this attitude that if you can't kind of make it in your own country, that how are you supposed to kind of then replicate that overseas? Awesome. Uh, do you have kids? Mm -hmm. um, this is a bit of a personal question, but uh, yeah, do you have kids or if not, how come? I don't have children and it's a good question. I <laughs> Whenever I go to Christmas dinner, people will always say, oh, you know, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to settle down? You know, when are you going to be responsible? You know, and I'll, I'll be kind of the odd man out or the black sheep because there's cousins everywhere and all the rest of it, kids running around. But my answer to them usually is, you know, haven't you seen my films? You know, because every film that I've made, I've given birth to the idea. It's like taking a, a child to school or get like to, um, teaching them to ride a bike. They've got to put training wheels on. You've got to, you, do you know what I'm trying to say? You've got to, got to kind of teach them. So I, I feel that, you know, for every movie that I make, you're looking at a minimum three year journey, you know, a process. So it's, it, you know, you, essentially, you know, you're giving birth to an idea and then you're, you're building it. It's like, you know, you, uh, with a plant, you know, you're putting, pouring water onto the plant to make it grow. It's the same philosophy. So I think my time has been spent in giving birth to the ideas of the films that I've made rather than physical beings. Yeah. Fair enough. I heard you pulled a stunt on one of the actresses on set. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? That was an awesome day because there was a scene with Mary, who's playing Esme, and uh, <laughs> the masked Avengers, they come to her door and they, they scare the hell out of her, basically. She's not expecting them. And so she said to me, um, I don't know, I don't care what it is, but when you do my shot and you open the door and, and you see me all scared, do something to frighten me. Mm -hmm. I said, you sure? And she said, yep, just, just do it. I want to be surprised. I don't care what it is, but just frighten me. I said, okay. So luckily I had some props on standby. I had one prop that was a severed head in a jar. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty scary. Uh, which I was using in a later scene and she hadn't seen it. I think it was in my car boot actually. Um, and so uh, she opened the door and I just kind of rammed this, you know, this head in front of her and she freaked, you know, cause she was just like I not expecting that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened there. Do you think you'll make another type of this particular genre style or will you move on to something different? Tell us a bit about that. There was the idea of a prequel because the girls were having so much fun, you know, on this set and dressed up in black PVC, playing these masked Avengers and kicking ass. Yeah. There was a lot of hype, you know, it was like, it was a fun, they were fun characters to play. The girls kept saying, well, what about the backstory? You know, can we do more? They just, they were just addicted to it. So I said, well, you know, there could, I could entertain the idea of a prequel perhaps where um, before Esme is killed and Esme joins this, the Ishtar organisation and it's filled with master venues and, you know, maybe there could be another, uh, another episode with, you know, within the landscape of, of this movie um, and this idea. So it was talked about. I, I don't think I'd do a sequel, but, you know, if there was a prequel, maybe. Um, these sorts of movies, they're awesome, you know, but they do take a lot of energy. And one of the things I've always done is sort of change genre. So I've sort of done my martial arts film and my next film is a completely different genre. So whether I, I wouldn't do it again immediately, but maybe something I come back to later, who knows? But they certainly were keen. I'm sure if I put out a casting call for another film like this, definitely there'd be interest. Now you've been with a lot of leading ladies now. Can you tell us about any favourites at all? Are you allowed to say any favourites? <laughs> yes, very lucky to have many beautiful, gorgeous, amazing people, lovely uh, love interests. Um, you know, they're all different, each to their own. Uh, every every on-screen romance I've had, the partner has usually been married, you know, or taken and very professional. Um, and has always had a different approach to how they act. I mean, you know, all the leading ladies, they're all beautiful and unique in their own way. Um, and you can't, you can't help sometimes but sort of think, wow, you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to be working with this person. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's all about being professional. I think as far as favourites go, um, 
they're all they're all great. You know, I, I don't I don't think I would I would say one's better than the other. You know, and if I if I did, I'm probably going to get a punch in the face. <laughs> so let's let's just say they're all adorable. Yeah. Very diplomatic answer. I'm sure something that all your fans would like to know is um, what's next on the slate for the Nathan Hill Productions. So the next film I'm working on is called Colorblind, which is a bit of a slow burning thriller. Uh, it's a bit of a throwback to the, the Hitchcock films. Mm -hmm. um, if you think Vertigo, that's a, that's a good example. Uh, and we have um, been fortunate enough to get uh, actress Jane Badler, who used to act in the series V. She's quite famous for that in the kind of late 80s, which is a show I used to watch, so it's amazing having her. Um, and a phenomenal cast uh, of actors from uh, pretty much all around the world, to be honest. It's an, it's an amazing ensemble cast. So we're in post-production at the moment, I'm absolutely loving it. Um, I mean, I love Revenge of the Guaylo. You know, I, I really felt like um, this, is, this is my peak film, but looking at the uh, post-production of Colorblind, it's actually, it's actually quite awesome. It could actually be a better film. So if I'm allowed to say that, you know. <laughs> awesome, we look forward to that. It sounds really exciting. Thank you for um, doing the interview with us today. That's cool, thanks a lot.